I just want to welcome you all and thank you all for joining us today. Colm, Antonia, Amy, Beth, James and Orla, you're all very welcome. Thanks guys. So I'm just going to start and talk uh, with Colm a little bit about the genesis of the film and then I'm going to bring in the rest of the guys. But um, Colm, uh, you're very welcome. Um, Black Medicine's your first feature. I know you had shorts like Here and uh, The Morgan, which I really liked. Previous to that, we, you have an interesting background in coming to film directing. I believe it involved a transition from law to working with the stunt teams. Yeah. Um, how, how did you come into your journey to being a filmmaker? Um, well, I, I always wanted to do film, but I just kind of felt it was very impossible. Certainly whenever I was kind of in those formative years of, I don't know, 12, 13, 14, there was nothing happening in Northern Ireland at all, really. And uh, it just seemed impossible. So I went and did a law degree which was a waste of time. But um, while, I, while I sort of was finishing that up, I applied for a job on Your Highness, which was shooting here. And then I sort of fell in with a few of the guys from the AD department that do a lot of these big movies, second unit. There was a guy, Terence Madden, who sort of picked me up and put me in a few jobs. Um, and they do like all these, like, you know, talking like Skyfall and Edge of Tomorrow and all those sort of big mega blockbuster type things that have a second unit. And then I would always wanted to make films, but I was always more sort of writing and didn't have a lot of bravery to kind of go and make a short. Uh, but then I just decided, right, I'm just going to go and do it. And then I made a film called Say Nothing, which did quite well on a sort of 200 pound budget. And then I went to film school and that was kind of how I got sucked into the whole thing. I, I don't think it's an uncommon one, uh, journey like from another thing into actually I can do film, but I do like the way you went from law as a waste of time into the film industry. That's quite, quite <laughs> inspiring for a lot of people, I would imagine. Um, so this is your first feature. Um, and as I said at the start, it's it's a fantastic premise. Um, where did that idea come from, especially with the, I suppose, A, the black market medics thing is always fascinating, but it, it seems so rooted in Northern Ireland and kind of authentic. How, how did you kind of manage to put those two worlds together? Um, well, I think it just kind of um, progressed with time. It was one of those films that actually did change a lot in development. You know, the core idea was a black market doctor, which I always loved. And I thought, like, how would somebody end up in that scenario? And, you know, if you did have these amazing medical skills that are so hard to acquire and expensive to acquire, and they're so rooted in who you are as a person, would you be able to let that go if you were struck off and go into a different job? Or would you moonlight and do things like that? So I just thought it was a really interesting character. And then I thought, well, you know, what's the kind of moral dilemmas you can put someone in that sort of, uh, you know, world? What, what, what could really shake their belief systems and what would push them over the limit? And that this kind of thing, I don't know if the spoilers are allowed or not, or what's the... Yeah, I think it should be fine, but you're good to flag it. Okay, well, um, you know, going into organ harvesting and things like that, and, you know, I love the, the dynamic between two people. One of them, you know, would do anything to save her daughter's life, and the other would do anything to save a sort of person in society. You know, and Ireland is, has this huge wealth inequality gap and stuff now. It's like, what would you do to save your own daughter if you thought this other person was less not even less than human but just less valid as a member of society and wouldn't survive as long anyway so it was just kind of like trying to create something i i felt was a bit new with the organ harvesting as a bespoke operation not as like statecraft you know which does exist mm. uh, is particularly grim um but you know someone just doing a two-order kind of operation to save their daughter's life so that's that's kind of the progression that it took it's a great obstacle to put in front of someone as well, because I suppose there is the moral dilemma of our antagonist, uh, played by Orla, who we're going to come to uh, shortly, uh, like that it, she's the baddie of the film, essentially, but also it is for the love of her own child. Um, but it, it works really well within the context you set it in of the, um, I suppose, Joe uh, and Tony's car character and the black market medic thing it's a it's a great concept um what was it always your idea for a first feature this one or was it something that came to you i suppose as you were looking to make a first feature was it something you had in your head a while it was one of them you know i had i've had some other projects that are still kind of bubbling away in the background trying to get finance and stuff that you know potentially could have been first you know the morrigan as you mentioned was a short film that i made which we're kind of trying to get going at the minute but this was something that i felt 
could be done a bit cheaper and could be done as part of the Northern Ireland Screen New Focus, you know, scheme, which is by far the best, you know, in Northern Ireland, obviously. But, you know, if, one of the best there is full stop in terms of first feature funding. And, you know, you don't need to get a cast. You don't need to have sales agents and everything. So it's kind of a fast track. Um, so I was really anxious to kind of produce it through this. Like maybe, you know, the budget of this was probably a bit low for what I planned. But, um, you know, hopefully we kind of got through it okay. I think so. Like, and again, like, I love the ambition, like you had of, of this story. And I think you did incredibly well with it. Um, I was going to talk about the new talent initiative focus at Northern Ireland Screen in, uh, in a second. But I just wanted to check, did, did you have to do much research uh, into, I suppose, the, the background of the film and the black market medic kind of thing? Or um, how, how did you even go about that? Well, I have a friend who uh, was a doctor and he's since left and set up an internet company with my brother who, who was a barrister. So the two of them kind of had very good jobs and they just abandoned them all to do this mad internet company. But um, he was kind of giving me a lot of advice. And then I know an anesthetist, an anesthetist as well. And there's another guy I got put in touch with. So there are quite a few medical advisors and then my mate who used to be a doctor he was a medical advisor on set and then there was we had another uh, woman as well who was really excellent so obviously you know there's you know it's 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 sort of a heightened film like it's not you know meant to be completely realist but you know i from what i've researched and what i've been told it's fairly medically plausible and accurate well, well it certainly feels authentic like and i have no medical knowledge whatsoever but it, it felt like I could tell there was quite a lot of detail in there and like it never took you out of it in any way yeah, um were, were you always trying to write and direct it Colm uh you mentioned before you were uh more folks in writing early on um but was always your intention to write and direct this yeah I think so I think it's just you know it's so hard to write something and it's very hard to give it away if you know like I've had other projects certainly where I've sort of been encouraged that they're slightly higher budget to sort of give them to someone else to go and do to make mm. but I don't know you just I think it would just be gotten to see it up on the screen somebody else had done something you didn't like or whatever and like I, I you know I'm not against doing that in the future but uh yeah I think if you write something it's very personal to just give it away no I, I, I can appreciate that um I'll just go back a little bit before we bring in the rest of the guys to talk about NI Screen's new talent initiative focus like we have seen some really good films come out of that uh, bump along the way and the dig to name just two. Uh, but it is like you alluded to earlier, great to have that not quite risk free, but also like um, that they're willing to take a punt on like new talent in that kind of you'll have funding to this. You don't have to have necessarily proved yourself, you know, commercially and all this. And it's, it's a brilliant way to get new talent out there. What, what was that process like working within that structure? Um, well, it's kind of uh, there's there's a very, very good development person there called Ursula Devine who that's kind of her baby and she's been doing them from the inception of the program to what it is now um and you know she has the backing of Andrew Reid who's head of production so they kind of it's quite a streamlined process you're not taking loads of notes from different people but it is quite quality heavy so that you know they're not you know they won't go and do one one year if they don't think it's going to be you know ready or good but uh, you get a lot of notes you know I think as you get on you know certainly for me you, know, you you start to appreciate like free development you know like like you know like i send a script off and you wait like weeks to hear back you know ursula and you know you get it all very quickly and it's just if they're interested they think it's a good script but it needs work you know you can fast track in a way that you know just doesn't seem to exist anywhere else especially with cast you know you don't want to go to a sales agent like the list you get for sales agents for independent film of the cast that they want is just insane. You know, I have amazing cast here. And, you know, if you go to a sales agent, they might demand X, Y, Z, you know, and it just slows everything down and kind of collapses the project. Well, uh, I, I can understand exactly what you're saying about like a lot of sales agents looking for kind of ridiculous expectations at cast but you've assembled an absolutely fantastic cast here. Um, the casting process is, I suppose, a lot of ways one of the most we were talking with someone was it yesterday's one about the most frightening things for a director is like a lot so much of your vision rests on like the cast and uh the guys we have here have been fantastic um 
I'll just start a little bit about the casting process, but um, Antonia's Joe is just so central to the whole film. Like it's, um, it, it like really focuses on her quite a lot and she really has a great presence on the screen. Um, how did you go about casting Joe in the first place? Um, well, they, they kind of, um, this is the, I, I was quite lucky with Antonia because she was involved in another project with an executive producer on uh, on Black Medicine, the guy who actually was originally the producer, Martin Brennan. Um, but uh, so I had mentioned Antonia to Martin, as a, you know, and he was very keen. We were also running a bit low on time as well. But, um, you know, I, I wasn't sure it would really be something that would interest Antonia because it's slightly more commercial, maybe, or slightly more mainstream than what she would. Well, that that's my perception, of Antonia, which is <laughs> Why is Gar laughing? This is hilarious. <laughs> so uh, I, we reached out to Antonia. I, di I, I didn't have a whole lot of hope, but Antonia thankfully uh, decided she liked the script. And, it, you know, and it's, she's in every scene, more or less. And, you know, like if it didn't work with Antonia, it was just going to be a mess. So I'm very grateful. And also Antonia, Orla was like top of my list for uh, Bernadette. But Antonia was like, oh, I was just working with her. I'll message her. I was like. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is coming up, Colin. <laughs> yeah, for a day or two. Um, about this time. Antonia, yeah. what did you like about the script in the first place? Um, even though, as Colin said, it might not, might be too commercial for your, what yeah, appears to well, well, I mean, that's, it's, it's, um, you know, I think uh, as an actor, every actor wants to do something new. I mean, that's the whole point of continuing to work in our field is that we always want to, um, you know, take on a new challenge. But that producer in question, Martin Brennan, I was sitting in a restaurant and I got a call from him and he literally gave me like an elevator pitch that Colin might shriek at. But um, he said, <laughs> it is you are never really here, but a woman in Belfast. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, yeah, I'll do it, 100%. You know, like it, and that definitely sold me. And then I was like, I should probably read the script mm -hmm. after I said yes. <laughs> um, but I think that kind of carries through because for me, it is, it was about like, you know, the script was great. It was really interesting. I liked the fact it was, it was unlike anything I'd done before. And I really wanted to show what, you know, that I could play a medic or, you know, someone that in, in that field. And, um, but her tonality, I think, was quite. It was is kind of key to what makes Joe quite unique, you know. Um, I thought for me it was very important to not, you know, that uh, put on the the outfit of somebody who kind of, you know, the usual stereotypes that we see of women grieving, or we that we are very lucky to see a lot of very strong females depicted on screen. But it's like despite their strength that is the the forefront they ultimately seem to reach into their back pocket and produce this really kind nurturing maternal aspect that is is you know is easy to kind of reach back and, and use therefore and i wanted joe to maybe not just conform to that and i think that's what's quite interesting about her that's brilliant. That's a great answer. And it actually brings me quite neatly to Orla, who we spoke to earlier this week about Rose Plays Judy and the very interesting um, maternal character. Again, two very different ones uh, between Black Medicine and Rose Plays Julie. Uh, what, what attracted you to the, the script as Bernadette, Orla, apart from a phone call from Antonio? Well, yes, I mean, that was the <laughs> I think we all got this elevator pitch, but I got it from Antonia. I, I I think the first, I think it was this way around that the first I heard was a message from you, Antonia, and um, uh, and I, we had done a film earlier that year, although not been in the same scenes, and I found uh, it intriguing to work opposite her. Obviously, I had read the script at this stage, um, and the the film is very very. It, 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 the central character of Joe has to work or the film wouldn't work as, as Colin says. And um, I was intrigued to work opposite Antonia because I found her quality very, very wonderful. And um, so I was very happy to do it on that basis. I thought the whole, the film worked. I liked how it felt that it could have been in Oslo or you could, yeah. somewhere else. I liked the idea 
also of how we um, value certain people and don't value others. So there's this disposable girl and she would have been found dead at some point and people would have thought, well, druggy, whatever. So uh, the same value is, wouldn't be placed on her death. The same effort might not be put into how that happened as it would be to somebody who we do deem valuable. I found those aspects hmm. of it really, really good. Um, I mean, there's lots more to say about it, but um, yeah, it was, it was, uh, it, I got a lot of, uh, I got a lot of pestering, pleasant pestering from Antonio going, come on, mate, come on, come on. Cause I was just finishing a job. I wasn't ready to do it. I was trying to get back cause it was just before Christmas, wasn't it? And I was trying to get yeah. back home after a long time away from home. So I was going, oh, I can't really sort of do this. And then um, Antonia persuaded me in a good way. And the script persuaded me obviously. And I'm very glad I did do it because I enjoyed it. I think it's good. It is. Um, and uh, Colum, I'm going to come to Amy Beth now in two seconds. But first, you mentioned earlier that Orla was always your first choice to play Bernadette. What was it about her that made you want like her to be your first choice? Mm -hmm. um, Careful. Careful. <laughs> <laughs> Orla has a, a very, I don't know, what is it? Like a charismatic presence in that I could just see everybody jumping around doing what Orla would want in an organization. You know, I think there's there's like, uh, you know, there's people who just are like leaders and I wanted Bernadette to be a leader and I could, un, you know, so the people could un understand how, you know, if, if the, the husband, maybe he and her co-ran the empire that they had, but it needed to be someone formidable enough that they could maintain that. And I, I didn't, I, there's a lot of actresses I didn't really feel, you know, maybe had that quality. And I'd seen Orla in quite a lot of sort of strong female roles. And, you know, I just thought, she, you know, she could be the boss of this gang, no problem. And, you know, and she had, she has a like fierce intelligence as well that I thought Bernadette would need to have to kind of run something like this, or even just to have the belief that she could do it and get away with it. You know, I don't think, I don't think there was any doubt in the performance that Bernadette could do this and get away with it. Like if Antonia's character wasn't involved. So, yeah. Yeah, very, very true. Um, uh, on that as well, we like uh, to complete the triptych of fantastic casting and people we have to talk with here. <clears throat> we also have um, Amy Beth McNulty, who a lot of people will know from Anne with an E and soon Stranger Things, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. um, how, how did you come by uh, Amy Beth, who's like really absolutely fantastic in that role as well? Um, I think the, the way it came about was uh, the casting director, Georgia Simpson. Um, she's with, I think, the same agency as Amy Beth, Lisa Richards. Yeah. And she was, she said, look, Amy Beth would be great. You know, I'd sort of spoken about elevating the film with the cast and not being afraid to go a bit further afield for cast and prioritizing cast in terms of you know, where we were going to allocate our money and things. And she was like, well, you have to have to talk to Amy Beth McNulty. And then I sort of caught up with Anne with an E. And I felt it was a very different rule and a lot more yeah. sort of sweet and nice. So I thought, you know what? I love Donegal anyway. I'm going to drive down to Donegal and meet Amy Beth. And I met her and her lovely granny. And we had a little session in the theatre. And then I said, yeah, let's, if you're up for doing it, which I'm very mm -hmm. glad. You did. And yeah, that was how that came about. It's a, it's a terrific role, Amy Beth, as well, uh, Anya. She's um, a, a really interesting character, and as Colm said, quite different from what he would have seen in previously. Um, had, had you any idea of the role before Colm came to visit your granny, or <laughs> had it been something that you put your way? I, I did struggle with it. I mean, after playing Anne for, for three years, because I was 18 when I was asked to do this, mm. and reading the script, I knew it'd be different, and that is selfishly, it, it intrigued me as an actor. Um, but I had a lot of fear going into it and I think I really wanted to meet you especially just for guidance and for assistance and just branching out and doing something completely different um, and I received that and more and we did rehearsals in the theatre I grew up in from the age of five which was all just a bit weird um, and I got really really lucky because it was something I desperately wanted to do and also to be in a triangle of these three very powerful women, uh, which you don't see. I was, you know, amazed by the script and was very, very fortunate to be a part of it. Fantastic. Um, it really is like a terrific script and three incredibly different 
like powerful female roles, but all very, very different. I think it's it's great to see that on screen with such talented actors. Um, James, I'm going to turn to you now a little bit. Um, you did a really great job in the music, and I believe you've worked on uh, some other Northern Irish screen um, productions like um, The Dig and Bad Day for the Cut, if yeah. I'm not mistaken. Yeah, uh, um, what... oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Um, uh, so, so what is it? How did you get involved with um, Black Medicine? Uh, Colin asked me. Um, I said, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, because I'd heard about the film being made and I do a lot of dark stuff and um, I didn't know anything about the film really, but um, the title itself just thought, oh, Black Medicine, that's got to be something dark. And then um, he contacted me. Um, no, it's actually Janine, uh, the producer. Um, who I've worked with before and then so I had a meeting with Colin and Frederick the um, the editor and yeah it was a great meeting I mean Colin's first words were um, basically don't play it safe with the score just uh, experiment and just do something quirky uh, so I yeah I just we, we just tr tried out different things and uh, it was a good result so absolutely and it, it is quite like a a thick kind of foreboding vibe you can kind of add to it. Um, yeah, and it um, is here. Yeah. I mean, I did, I, I sampled the column that I actually forgot to tell this, but I actually sampled the heartbeats and stuff that I, um because the film has a, obviously it's about a heart, not giving spoilers away, but so um I sampled sort of just different things and I had the sample of these heartbeats, but you don't really hear them now because I use synths to recreate them in layers, but there's a lot of pulsing sort of, um in a lot of the scenes basically like especially the, the like the last half hour really which is all in the operating room and then the very beginning scene as well there's a lot of uh this heartbeat sort of uh tone i suppose so. that's really cool um colin you didn't know that no i did yeah. <laughs> I, I sampled colin's heart without him realizing so. <laughs> yeah, i thought you know there was yeah like even the the bit where orla kind of like, I don't know if anybody's seen the film or not here, but I'm just going to go ahead anyway. But, you know, Orta walks and opens the curtains, you know, all the kind of out external sound goes off and it's just like a wall. wall. Yeah. And then it dies off. At that was actually one of the first it. scenes we worked on and it really, it, it landed the tone of the film, really. So um, that was our kind of template from there. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, and just um, worked from that, basically. Fantastic. I'll come back to you shortly, James, to talk about like your process on the film. But um, just to go back to Colm at the moment, in terms of okay, you did a great cast, um, in terms of getting the rest of the crew, like there's obviously so much great work happening in Northern Ireland at the moment. And like the crew base of like incredibly talented crew is just growing and growing. But I imagine they're all quite busy. How, how did you go about crewing up around the rest of it? Did you have much time for that process? Well, we didn't have much time at all, really, because at the time we got the green light, like you can go and make this. Um, there was a lot of stuff coming in in January. Like, you know, there was another Martin film, Zone 414. There was like Line of Duty. There was like a, another Netflix thing. And it's like, they, those are mega rates and everybody's doing great. But we had, you know, there's a three or four week lull before Christmas. And it was like, do you sacrifice some prep time? and get all the crew you want, or do you try your luck in January with everybody working? So we decided to go go ahead before um, before Christmas, which, you know, made it very rushed. But, you know, even everybody seems to wind down to December. So, you know, it was like, even maybe I wouldn't have got as good a cast. You know, people were like, I'm going to do one more before Christmas. And, you know, people were excited to kind of just get one more job in, even if it wasn't a super well-paying job, you know. But um, it, there's pros and cons because it is great that, the, you know, things are so busy here and it is training people up and things. But if you're making a little movie, it's it can be difficult. And uh, how long did you have to shoot for in total then, did you say? 18 days. Jeez, that's that's not a lot, long time at all. Um, that's remarkable, actually, having seen the film. Um, can, can you tell me a little bit about the, the shoot then, especially, I suppose, the transition from having made shorts and stuff to go into a feature over 18 days and you know working with this cast like uh were there any particular challenges you found that you'll bring with you to the next project or that you'd like to share with I suppose people looking to transition from short to feature I don't know I think there's a lot of the same problems it's just you're just fighting against the clock all the time and there's some things that you know you could do better but you just have to sacrifice stuff and you know I was rewriting and 
cutting things out and stuff to try and you know make sure it still worked but you know there was a scene here maybe i could combine with another scene and stuff like that so your head just gets a bit you know confused but um i, I think the main thing is just the time the time is so difficult and you know, especially the surgery stuff, because, you know, I, we had no rehearsals or anything for that. So like, I'm trying to wrap my head around it while, you know, the actors are trying to learn and while like I'm shooting rehearsals. So I'm trying to even just pick up inserts, like while we're doing rehearsals, I try to pick up, you know, cause you get like a scalpel that the actor can do that. Doesn't know what they're doing, you know? So you're just trying to build up footage all the time and try and have something that's going to be coherent when you come to the edit. But I don't know if that's best practice, but that's kind of the, that's the, the, that's the balls we had to play with and that. You know. I imagine that's probably a lot more standard and best practice than you think. Um, just turning to the cast again, talk about the shoot. Uh, we, we are, as I say, we spoke to Orla during the week about, you mentioned about your process on Rose Plays Julie that you had a very, quietness was very important to you. And, mm. and, and then yesterday we were talking to some of the cast and crew behind the bright side. And Gemma Lea Devereaux said hers was the opposite, which was just missing and distracting everybody until the cameras rolled, because otherwise she'd get two in her own head. Um, I'd just like to talk to you a little bit about, I suppose, your experience on the set of Black Medicine and what your approach to something like that is. Antonia, if I could start with you, I mean, about getting into Joe on set during like what I imagine was quite a, a hectic shoot. Um, yeah, but I think that, um, I, don't, I mean, I suppose what Joe is in the midst of is kind of, she's just come, you know, it's, it's such a, a dull word in a sense, but survival, you know, so she's very, there's a functionality to her and obviously I mean we see that because she's self-medicating and I think that the character we see of Jo is probably a version of what she's always been and that's why she has had this tragedy with losing her child of, you know a medical oversight let's say that leads to a tragedy but it is someone who's um completely addicted to their work and the function of that and um I think that level of adrenaline and drive and focus is what entirely encompasses Joe, you know? And I always, I felt that there was a kind of, I don't know, it's, it's like, um, it's, it's like having so much tension in your neck. <laughs> That's what I saw as Joe, you know, it's like there's an inability to ever relax or release. So it's like mm -hmm. a very, it's like a clenched fist at all times. That's Joe. <laughs> no, but I mean, that's kind of, yeah, because I think the, the thing with her is that um, if she was ever able to um, allow herself to feel in a greater expanse, it would all crumble. And I think that's what you have to be somewhat in the profession that she does, you mm -hmm. know, and to take on a sort of black market medical arena, you have to have a sort of a boldness and a, a, a control of your emotional stance status. Um, and that's why she control said, is a great word for her. She seems incredibly like controlled at all times. Like, yeah, absolute control. But it's um, you know, it's it's um, it's out of necessity because if she doesn't control, have complete um, control and a, a dominance of that, then grief would overwhelm her. Basically, but it's always under the surface with her. Um, Amy Beth, for you in terms of Anya, um, what, what was your process like in getting a character? And do you have a particular like workflow on set for that? Or and like was it how was it on the set of Black Medicine? I think my I'm weird, I don't have a process particularly. I especially don't have a process that's through every project I do, it shifts completely every time. Um, but the process I had this time was being 18, living in my own flat for the first time in Belfast, so I was vaguely experiencing that sort of turmoil of what do I do and how do I become an adult for the first time, um, whereas Anya had already been going through that for years and she she had it down, she was fighting every day and again the human instincts to survive, like Antonia said, that was sort of where she was at. Um, but I watched a lot of documentaries, I think it was through the BBC, of homelessness in the UK and particularly focusing on homelessness in teenagers and what they experience and just really trying to watch those and imagine what this poor girl had ever experienced and we don't know if she was ever addicted to anything or, or what kind of drugs she may have done and then the boyfriend situation because she needed protection um, but she was 
I mean, she's a feisty wee one. She's not going to give up because she can't. She has no choice. Um, and then I think her shield slowly comes down um, when Joe enters the picture. And it's that motherly figure that that trauma has kind of been in the back of her head. And that was the moment that she could find a parental figure, even for a short mm -hmm. amount of time. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's interesting to see her sort of develop over the movie. Um, and hope that everything worked out for her. Yeah, it's, it's a terrific relationship she has with Joe and the two of you, I think, carry that really fabulously. Um, Orla, just to turn to you on Bernadette again, like we spoke earlier about, I suppose, the kind of reserve like she has in, like, she, it could be very easy to play her as something of a kind of over the top, almost cartoony villain when it comes to like organ harvesting and stuff. But there's there's an interesting thing to her in that she is still doing this for love her daughter, but again, sacrificing someone she thinks is lesser to do that. Uh, how, do, how did you approach that? Um, well, it, this, it, Colm mentioned earlier um, the time element and because it was uh, happening suddenly for me and I wasn't, I didn't have tons of time to prep. So it was, it was both before and during the shooting, it was kind of seat of the pants. It's, it's, I think several of us were working more on instinct than on a carefully laid out plan. And I love having time before a film or before a role of any kind. I love having time to think and to settle into it and make all sorts of try this choice. Mm, that doesn't work. Try something else, you know, really, really consider it. Um, that wasn't possible here. Um, so the one thing I remember us talking about on our conversation column is that we wanted to make her charming because the monster that's monstrous is less interesting to me. And also someone even in the underworld rises to a position of power for a reason and they can charm, they can be charming. And, and I think we wanted to feel that if you met her and didn't know anything about what she can do you would you would experience her as somebody who you'd want to know who yeah. you think is 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 gosh you know what a good evening we had and how welcoming this person was um i think that might be uh, more the truth of people who do monstrous deeds um i think that's what you wrote and that's what i was hoping to fulfill um so i hope we got that but uh, there was very little prep in the normal sense I, I remember not long after a call with you I just was on a train to Belfast thinking oh this character is extreme and I hope I get there and I have to do my Christmas shopping you know <laughs> so, so it was more that you just uh, in this instance I sort of just threw myself into it and I think it, I think it really worked yeah I really liked your performance I thought it was perfect but I think the question that came from it is like I definitely wanted people to go heart of hearts. If I was in her position, what would I do? You know, and everybody has this dark side to them. Yes. You know, and I think that's that's something, you know, like, you know, even even Orla repeats that accusation back to Antonia. You know, you mm. you'd have done the same if it was your child, like in just straight out. It's yeah. But I mean, I was so what I always thought of it was like it's about justice. So it's about taking the personal emotional stance or whether we're looking at, you know, the objective position and that is what is justice. Mm. That's where the- Do you, do you of... care about that when it's your own kid though? You know, it's like ethics and morals, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, that, if you- I think, if I think that's... that the inherent kind of philosophical debate in the film and between the two characters really is that kind of thing of objectively it's monstrous and wrong, but subjectively it's, you know, potentially something you could do. And I think that's that's really well realized between these characters. Well, yeah, because um, Bernadette basically challenges Joe and says, of course you can take that stance because your kid is dead. Sorry, like, mm. spoiler alert, but, um, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> you can be objective and you have nothing to lose. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that, that certainly comes across. Uh, Colm, just in terms of, spoke to the actors there about their kind of, I suppose, um, ways into the character and uh, Orla mentioned kind of, you know, working by instinct. What, what, what do you think is your normal approach to like work with actors across your shorts? And um, did anything change in the the feature? Um, I, I know it was a very tight schedule. As you said, um, how has your work as a director with actors changed? I suppose through Black Medicine. I think when you start out, you know, you have this idea of getting what's in here on, you know, on the screen. And I think that's really 
silly. Most people grow out of that after a while. You know, I definitely grew out of it. And I think it comes to a point, you've got so much other stuff going on, that you have to trust the actors that you've cast and you have to believe in them. And, you know, I think, you know, the, when it comes to directing actors, I think casting actors is like 90% of it. So if you get the right cast, then you can, you know, you can let them do their work. Whereas if you've miscast, then you're trying to re you're trying to correct the whole time. And on a sort of film of our schedule and budget, then you really can't, you know, I can sort of try and guide or give a bit of background, but you know, I, I, I just try to trust the actors as much as I can and don't be afraid of them. You know, you, everybody's afraid of actors early on. Well, I'd love to comment. Are you? <laughs> yeah. well, I'd love to comment on that because I remember when it was first sent to me and I spoke to Colm, I think the first thing I said was, are, are you sure? <laughs> are you sure? Um, but, um, and I think you were very generous with allowing me to make sort of choices with Joe. And, you know, I don't think I was exactly what you put on the page initially when you had an image of her in your mind, you know? And, um, and I, not all directors will do that. I think it's very important, yeah. So thank you. That, that's great, like to have that space uh, provided to kind of interrogate the character yourself and kind of add to it. And like Colm, as you were saying, that thing of, you know, people, you want to kind of force what's in there out, whereas really becomes cliches, it sounds like an invitation to collaborate and make something that's more than the sum of its yeah, parts. Yeah. yeah, well, that's the, that's the ideal. That's what you're, that's what you're going for. You know, it's, it's obviously a bit unsettling, you know, like, but you, know, you feel like a loss of control, you know, early on. But I, you know, I think you just have to embrace the madness a wee bit and let it, you try and guide it, but it's going to become its own thing eventually. So. And I think that's something a lot of people don't accept or can't accept that it is going to become its own thing. It's never going to be the thing that's there. It's going to be its own thing. And if you create that space and guide it, it can be something even better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I was just going to say, Antonio, you obviously uh, direct as well and write, and just as an actor, how, how do you do you find that changes how you approach like working with other directors? Do you can are you kind of looking at how they direct, or are you just in actor mode at that time? Uh, you have to be in actor mode. <laughs> but it's funny because again, when I got that call, um, I was quite busy, I think, and I went, I'm not going to do a film for that amount. Of, oh, hang on, I have to get actors to do my film for that amount of money. Um, and I thought it'd also be really interesting, you know, just to be in. The, it's a similar budget to my to my film, um, aren't they? Ish, approximately. And um, and so yeah, I, I mean, I've always really, really loved um, having constraints. I love being in films that have small budgets because I think people are very innovative and resourceful, et cetera. You know, actually, sometimes it can produce the be better work. And I get very frustrated as an actor when I see waste, cash waste, which there is a lot of, you know? Mm -hmm. But um, yes, I very much, I think directing and acting are completely opposite um, areas of the brain even, you know? One is completely open to receive and deliver. And, um, and I think it's much more bodily for me, like as an actor, like I was talking about, I don't, as Amy Beth said, I don't have like a go-to specific process, but for me it's absolutely bodily. Like I have to feel a character consistently. Um, but as a director, you're just constantly thinking. You never stop. Constantly. So go from physical to cerebral, like, or? As a director, you mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sort of, I mean, just like, it's just, I think it's just, it's much more in the head than in the body. I don't know, it sounds like um, I'm a hippie, but it, I'm not. Um, no, that's, <laughs> you're, that's, you're right. It's, it's one, yeah. one lives, it's in, you're in the back brain, you're in the kind yeah. of reptile brain. You can't, you can't, you know, for example, judge the character, which, which when you're, when you're being her. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're exactly um, right. You, yeah, but um, no, it's, I really, I love directing because I like having a very active mind, but it is, it's, it's, it's a sort of, it's not, um, it's very much not of the self. It's very externalized. Mm -hmm. You have to think about everyone else. That's, that's a really intriguing answer. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I'm just going to bring James back into it. And guys, I've got a few questions coming in here, so please do keep them coming. Um, James, when, when did you get involved in the process? I never asked that earlier. Like, did you come in once the film was kind of shot? Were you on board for um, it was, uh, Colin was, you're still, you're still at the thing because I remember the first cut I saw was very different. Like the first mm. 20 minutes was completely different, I think, as in 
the scenes were all like all moved around but um i came i think i started about four weeks before the mix i think it was because we were rushing because um there was a deadline but then lockdown happened yeah. and uh it happened like we <laughs> i see there was no need to rush yeah, <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah and uh yeah, so it was about four or five weeks I got um, from being asked to until I until the week before the mix. Oh, well, no, when was the mix, Colin? No, oh, hang on. He didn't no, know the, till like November the following year. Oh no, the mix was yeah. It was meant to be. It was meant to be the week. Then lockdown happened. That's what it was. And uh, so yeah, so um, I would have had an extra eight months. <laughs> mm. <laughs> but, um, but yeah. Um, and did your approach to it change with that extended period of time? Because well, you no, about, like bringing in the kind of themes or like the tones of the heartbeat. Um, like I mean, that. like like we said, it like t time is always a great thing, but everything I do is is always is very it, it, unless I'm getting involved in the project from script stage, um, then you have loads of time. But usually, I just get sent a cut of the film, um, and we're, we're literally straight in. Is that communication is the main thing that really talk out ideas and stuff. And then um, once you sort of land that first scene that me and Colin were like, working on, then you just, yeah, that's the tone. And then we just went from there, really. Can you guys still hear me? Yes. Yeah. 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 OK. <laughs> I can't hear you at the moment. Let me two seconds. Oh, no. But uh, I just got a question in here from a Rob Walsh. He says, Colin, can you talk about the opening shots of the film? Were you inspired by heat? Man and, and Antonio, your character was in a constant state of anxiety and stress, which you did incredibly. Did you find it difficult to maintain that mental state? So two questions there. The first one, Colm, can you talk about the opening scene and were you inspired by Michael Mann? And the second one, Antonio, did you find it difficult to maintain the character of Jim? Um, yeah, well, like, uh, Michael Mann is just brilliant, I think. You know, um, Thief was actually probably more of a of a sort of influence on this. Obviously I would love to be able to shoot something like Michael Mann would shoot it. You know, I did like, this is kind of my Belfast version of Michael Mann. Um, and we, well, they actually, the, the uh, opening scene through the car park, which kind of repeats itself, you know, at the end, I was out with a friend of mine and um, we were shooting, um, you know, just, I can't remember what we were, we were trying to work out some car stuff. We had our own like sort of rig and everything. Like we did, during lockdown, like we shot a lot of stuff on Black Magic, like little like sort of cutaways and inserts and things, stuff that we did not time to get during the shoot, you know, people pressing a button in an elevator and stuff like that. Um, and I, I can't remember, did we have some of James's music in? And then we shot a little bit, went up and was like, oh man, that's pretty cool. And then we thought, well, if we could get Antonia coming back down just on her and it's just kind of, you see her going up in one state and then coming down, it's just like, like Antonio was never going to be a broken person to a fixed person. It was going to be like one inch in the right direction or two inches in the right direction. And I think you just see a glimmer of kind of hope at the end. And that, that was kind of the idea from the going up and the coming back down again, you know, to a bookend. Uh, it works very well. And that kind of classic screenwriting structure of like, you kind of mirror the beginning with the end, but as you said, one inch in the, in the right direction. Antonio, just that question for you. Um, from Rob Walsh again, like, did you, did you find it kind of hard to kind of, like you mentioned earlier about that kind of clenched fist kind of attitude yeah. and control? Um, I quite enjoy that though. Um, I, you know, it, it, because it was a short shoot, you can do things like that, I suppose. It's kind of the luxury of it, you know, when you have a, like a very con condensed period of time. And because it was every single day nonstop, you can just embody that being. Um, and because we did, we were mostly on split, so we're shooting, I mean, it was cold, it was dark, dark all the time. I don't think I slept, like, at all. Not intentionally, tried to sleep, couldn't. <laughs> but it all aided, you know, the process. And um, yeah, I really enjoyed that. Um, and I was very sick, I think, wasn't I? Yeah, really <laughs> you were. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, really was. <laughs> but then, then the whole planet got sick, so I can't complain. Um, but it uh no i mean it was it was a really enjoyable stress let's say like again bodily it's, i think it's a luxury as an actor to be able to just kind of go you know what i'm going to be totally self-involved in this character process
That's great. Uh, it, Amy Beth, uh, would you feel similarly or would you have a different view? I think I was stressed with the time limit, as was everybody. And I wasn't even shooting every single day like Antonia, so I have nothing to complain about. Um, I got very seasick on the boat when we were filming there. That was quite mm. unexpected. You know, you cope with it. It's your job. You deal with it. Um, so it was the time limit and that, but I think, I don't know, you just throw yourself into it. And sometimes you kind of have to fake confidence to yourself, never mind everybody else, to just get through the day and you sleep when you sleep and you work when you work and you just see how far you can get. Um, and I love it. I always love it. So I just can't really complain that much. I, don't know. I, got, to, I got to drive an amazing car. Mm. Yeah. It's kind of a beg, beg, borrow and steal film. It used to be my my granny had that car from new and she's, she's dead now, RIP. But uh, she, uh, my cousin has it. And uh, we, I was like, we've got to put this car in. And a friend of mine owned the, the apartment in the skyscraper as well. He gave it just for free and stuff like that. So it really was, it's kind of team effort making something like this. I think actually one of the things I found really stressful was some of that driving that we did, we did a pickup day, right, Colin? Mm -hmm. And um, you were in a tracking vehicle and you kept on the mic saying to me, faster, faster. And then literally, I mean, the car was about to fall apart. <laughs> I was driving so fast <laughs> on the auto route outside Belfast. Mm -hmm. That was quite, that was the only time I kind of felt slightly <laughs> anxious mm -hmm. on the whole shoot. You're a good driver, Anthony, it's okay. I am a good driver. <laughs> Um, sorry, there was a fire engine going past there, I had to mute. Um, Orla, well, what about you? Did, like you mentioned like it was quite an instinct of a Bernadette. What was, what was the shoot like for you? Did, did you manage to sleep or? Did... I had a complete, <laughs> I, I was a lucky one. Everything I did, because Bernadette was in her mansion and it really was <laughs> a mansion, it was an extraordinary house. And so I was in a nice heated carpeted, um, comfy sofa house for the whole thing. I think these two and the rest of the cast suffered um, a lot more than I did. Yeah, so it was fine. I was swathed in cashmere. It was, it was easy. So, <laughs> but I, 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 I think she'd be an really, every actor's writer. Yeah, no, well, it's rare. Thing. It is where you are normally uncomfortable. But I think, I mean, I really, really could see, I, I saw obviously most of Antonia more than any other character. And man, it was uncomfortable for you. It was cold and you were sick. And it was, and you really no, I, kind I, of. I'm so sorry. What's sorry. going? It's fine. But, has anyone else been thinking as well in the last week, the fact that, and I know we don't know all the facts yet, but this dreadful um, murder of Ashley Murphy, mm -hmm. um, the yeah. fact that the guy was identified because he went to hospital with wounds. Mm -hmm. It's just amazing mm -hmm. how sometimes a story that is written, I mean, you must have written it, what, five years ago, Colm, and it plays into something that, that, mm -hmm. that plays into the times. It just really struck really? me, you know, so... Anyway, do you find that Colin, with having written something like this, that you start seeing little kind of moments like in real life, that tragically and uh, very tragically in this case, that kind of resonate with it and work in it, possibly in a way you had not anticipated? I don't know. I, I made a short film before called Say Nothing, mm. and I feel it was a wee bit ahead of its time, but it was started on two guys, a guy and a girl walking past each other on the street, and obviously you see that something's happened, and you know, you cut back and it's a you know, a night out and the guy sort of gets the signals wrong and ends up raping this girl. And he wakes up the next morning, he's gonna, you know, t call the police and give himself up. And then his friend, you know, uh, says, no, don't do that, mate. You know, she'll never report it, the clothes she was wearing, like all society's kind of, um, you know, excuses. And I remember at the time, the feedback I got was, no, no, that wouldn't happen. You know, the people wouldn't like, you know, and, and then I, I feel like, as time has gone on, you know, that sort of stuff obviously happens a lot more often than it should. And people don't report it because they feel like the, the legal process is actually probably worse than the event or the aftermath. So I, I felt like that film, which I made like 10 years ago, has kind of caught up with the times quite a bit. But uh, yeah, more so than Black Medicine, but maybe that'll in the future. I don't know. Um, yeah, wow. Well, uh, that, that certainly sounds like something that like, is incredibly pertinent to, well, not just now, but all times, but in terms of the discourse we're having now, I suppose. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just gonna finish off with another question or two before I turn to some of the great questions we've got coming in there. But um, you mentioned about lockdown and stuff, Colm and James as well. 
But um, uh, your film, uh, kind of, uh, I think, premiered in Galway. It's been online and stuff. How has the response been to you know from people who've seen it and audiences and stuff? And how do you feel about putting it in front of you know people physically? Um, I think it plays a lot better on the cinema. You know, that's kind of whatever people are sort of locked in. Um, and that was obviously the way we intended, the way we sort of mixed it. And, you know, that was the, the initial kind of intention whenever we got distribution for it in the UK and Ireland. You know, I think just at that time, films did very poorly, independent films, whenever they opened and everybody was spaced out and everything. And it just didn't really make financial sense for anyone. So that was a bit disappointing, obviously, but um, like I hope it'll get seen, you know, more on like the bigger the screen, the better, really. Uh, yeah. I, that's a few distribution deals, different territories and things like that. But uh, just COVID was just a disaster for everybody. So I don't think we have any particular claim to any heartache, you know, but it was was a bit disappointing. I, I can imagine it would be a real audience film as well, like because uh, I'm just watching it. Uh... By myself or sorry my wife and I, I audibly gasped which is a weird thing to do when you're just in a room with your significant other but I can imagine like moments like in a big room to sit and be really feed back into other people and the same with James's score I suppose in a big big sound system um we've got some questions coming in here from people and quite a few statements um but uh, one here is from um Victoria Morell or sorry no from Renata Padilla who says to Amy Beth what was it like to play a character who had such a hard time in life. Uh, you, you alluded earlier to the fact that you just moved out of home and stuff yourself. Mm. But um, did, did like you, you said you watched those documentaries as well, but like how did that feel for you like embodying that role? I mean, I'm incredibly privileged. I live a very good life. I think everybody should have access to home, food, water, the basic necessities. Um, it was absolutely earth shattering and heartbreaking and I wasn't even experiencing it, to be honest. Um, I wanted the portrayal to be realistic. I didn't want it to be a character. I wanted it to be an experience. I wanted it to come across on screen, not just as all oh, this poor wee girl, more, wow, okay, this is happening in real life and there's actually something that we can do about it and help these situations. And the homelessness situation in Ireland is absolutely astronomical. I mean, it's, it blows my mind to this day. Um, and I think particularly for people in those situations that Aunt Anya went through, never mind the organ harvesting, like even just the experience that she had previous to what our story tells, and you can see how damaged she is by it, should be enough to shock people, hopefully into, you know, being proactive. Um, so as, as shattering and exhausting, I think, as it was for me, it was an honor to attempt to bring something from that. Um, and obviously with the script and everything, I was just a clog in the machine, but a humble clog nonetheless. A humble clog, I like that. Um, another, uh, I actually think this might be more of a statement here from uh, Ronan Tynan, uh, he's the director. He says, congrats Colm on a great thriller for a true thriller fan and incredible doing it all in 18 days. The three women really welded together with super performances, boosting the tension right to the last minute. But as someone who has worked on organs, organ harvesting in China, I'm going to assume he meant worked on a film about organ <laughs> harvesting in China. I found it even more chilling to have known, um, to have to know what was the inspiration for the film. Um, I mean, I, I, I think, I'm, I'm hoping this isn't the case like your, your previous film where suddenly we start hearing a lot of stories coming up about kind of organ harvesting, but it wouldn't actually surprise me at this point. I think it's, it's, it's there's, there's just a blood trade around the world. Mm. States, you know, they, they uh, I'm not going to name any states for fear of reprisals. I don't know if that's, but, uh, you know, there are state-sponsored organs, you know, prisoners and things, to, like organs to order. You know, you're a VIP, you're a very wealthy person, you just say, I need a kidney. They're just going to grab somebody out and get you a kidney. I mean, it's insane. It's crazy. And with the wealth of eye getting larger and larger and, you know, the needs of the top kind of severely seeming to outweigh the needs below, like if that is going to become more of a thing. Um, uh, just before I wrap up, uh, I want to check with James as well. James, you you mentioned you like kind of dark work and this this attracted you uh, to this. But um, like like the actors are saying, you know, it's kind of uh, the Amy Beth there hard to kind of stay out of the, you know, uh, earth shattering nature of a role like that or Antonia kind of quite enjoying that control. Like, um, like how, how do you kind of respond emotionally to your own kind of work in that kind of dark area you like to work in? Um... 
I, I do so much of it. It's almost my life, I suppose. <laughs> um, um, I, 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 I don't really know. Um, I've just always been into that sort of style of music and stuff like that. I mean, I, I, I listen to, I mean, I listen to dark music, sounds a bit odd, but you know, I listen to a lot of um, thriller stuff and just uh, a lot of soundtracks. And uh, I mean, the first album I bought was Iron Maiden, Number of the Beast. So, you know, and uh, <laughs> it's been to heavy metal and stuff like that. But um, so yeah, it was just the style. I just really like that style. I suppose, I mean, it's like, like the actresses and the actors, um, like I, I wasn't really getting, you know, I, mean, I got into the sort of character's mood for themes and things like that, but for me, it was more the whole tone of the film really. Um, and I, I wasn't uh, wasn't really getting a, a deep into the, the characters individually. I suppose it's just the, the overall tone. So, um, but yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you love the darkness, uh, 60 yeah, I, just, I just like doing dark yeah. stuff here. So. Brilliant. Um, good. Before we wrap up, I just uh, firstly like to thank you again for taking the time today. But I just uh, want to ask you what we're doing next, Column. That's a terrific first feature, like incredibly great premise, really ambitious, really well done, incredibly casted. So really well done to all of you on that. Um, but but I'm really looking forward to seeing what you do next. What's what's next for you, Column? Are you working on multiple scripts or anything at the moment? Yeah, I'm, I'm always working on multiple things in case one of them actually happens um no i have i have a kind of of two horror projects and uh, one of them's kind of like a social sort of horror the other one's the the feature length version of my short film the morgan i have an action adventure thing which is very early days with the company in the states which i really hope pans out and then i've, I've a low budget sort of crime thriller that i would you know i'd like to do but it's, it's all just getting finance and you know, day by day so fingers crossed well best of luck with all of that um amy, amy beth for you you've um, obviously you shot some stranger things recently which we presume you can't tell us anything about but uh what, what's next yeah. for you um well who knows i mean Stranger Things could go on to another season. I would have no idea. Genuinely, at this point, I don't know. Um, but at the moment, it's a lot of auditioning. But in the time that I have a break, I want to start writing short films. I'm following in your footsteps column. What can I say? Trying to, trying to. Um, so I'm just filming some stuff with my mates, really, and just trying to be creative. That's the best way to do it. And Antonio, you've got uh, quite a bit of work coming up, I imagine. Uh... Yeah. For, well, you're talking about <laughs> the, the being your directorial version. Actually, yeah. Yeah. what? <laughs> what's the, what's that? About? No, I was going to do in general that you're going to answer, but I, I kind of always think you can't ask an actor what we're going to do because either, either we're in a state I, I did of terror. I do preface that badly. Because, you're quite right. <laughs> because if there's nothing in the pipeline, you're in a state of terror, and you think that's it. I'm done. I'll never work again. <laughs> and if there is something in the pipeline, you usually can't talk about it. You're, yeah. you're just not supposed to, True. or you might put the curse on it you if something is. ambiguous of like, oh, I've got something really exciting coming out. Um, yeah, I've signed uh, an NDA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What am I, my, I'm my sorry, film, I interrupted you, Antonio. Sorry. Um, my film's going to a festival that shall be announced in co the coming weeks. <laughs> Um, Fantastic. Uh, Orla, I want to ask you because I understand there are several NDAs in play. So, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And um, James, for you? <laughs> um, well, in complete contradiction to what I said, I'm working on two uh, separate short films about uh, one's a, a kid who likes Frank Sinatra stuff, and then another one is a boy who's just really music, and they're completely not dark in the slightest. So, uh, <laughs> It's, um, and then I'm working on two separate albums, one a piano based, like chill out one and uh, another one working with local, local artists. So, um, yeah, a few things. Well, fantastic. And as, as Antonio said at the start, you want to do something new at all times because otherwise what's the point to keep going on in that. Uh, Colm, Amy, Beth, Antonia, James and Orla, just want to say thank you all again for taking the time today to join us. Uh, really uh, appreciate your time and uh, thank you for Black Medicine. Please keep us updated on its progress. and what you do next but um i've really enjoyed talking to you all today about it so thank you very much uh thank you at home for joining in as well to our members and other people of the industry we're going to be talking to the team behind the horror you are not my mother tomorrow and then on friday we're going to be talking to some of the people in zone 414 uh, including director andrew baird and also uh who we love with 
uh, the director, writers, and almost the entire cast, I think. So please stay tuned to study for that. But thank you again to the guys behind Black Medicine.